Um, okay, I'm really excited to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Jason Carter and Jana is his wife. They have been friends of mine for quite a few years. Um, how many hunters do we have in this room? Do you have any? Cool. Okay, this will be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so just let me tell you a few things about Jason. Um, he is one of the most accomplished do-it-yourself hunters in the Western North America. Um, his first hunting experience was at the age of five. Uh, by the time he graduated college in 1997, he began working for his father's then small family business. Jason started out proofreading articles and uh, data which would be printed in a newsletter, uh, with its first publication being only 15 pages. This business would evolve over the years and become known as the Hunt and Pull Magazine and Service, with 15,000 yearly paid memberships. Services offered included booking hunts for various clients, helping in purchasing and selling landowner tags, assisting in client applications for hunting draws, as well as obtaining BLM permits, and much more. In the year 2000, and for 16 subsequent years, Jason also became a guide to limited clientele. Um, in 2012, Jason also initiated a TV show with Under Armour, featured on the Outdoor Channel, called The Ridge, uh, Ridge Reaper, showcasing big game hunts taking place in the western U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Mexico. Now a leading researcher and co-owner for Epic Outdoors, Jason continues to share his passion for big game hunting. While known as one of the top mule deer hunters in the world, with his expertise, experience, knowledge, passion, and success, Jason's ability to hunt extends uh, to several big game species. Um, these same qualities have also been an essential role in his company's uh, growth and success. So to tell you more, here's Jason. <laughs> <laughs> There are a limited number of pages. The next season is never guaranteed. For ages, these stories have been shared around a hunter's campfire. Each chapter is built on friendships, challenges, failures, luck, and sometimes hard-earned success. The scenes that unfold in front of a hunter's eyes are priceless. Very few on this earth have come face to face with a bull elk on a September morning. Not everyone has witnessed the power of a bear protecting its territory. And not everyone has seen a big one sheep as it effortlessly moves through rugged terrain. We are lucky to see the world through a hunter's eyes.
Should we just start? Let me just start. All right, that's just a little something of my background. Um, whether you may be interested in hunting or not, business is business. And there's so much involved in business, as you guys know. I graduated with a uh, bachelor's in finance, and that was just the start. But when, when I was young, my dad just ground into me the time value of money, investing, working for yourself, and ground me out, ground me out. And so I don't feel like I was born. I tell Jana this all the time. I don't feel like the entrepreneur life, you know, was, was, was who I was naturally, but it was by force, by family force. And now I don't know anything else. And I can't do anything else. This is all I know. I'm 45 years old. And so here we go. I'm going to make money by whatever I do. And this is all I know. I don't do anything else. This is all I know. And so, you know, I don't, I don't get paid health insurance. I don't get paid vacations. I work way more than 40 hours a week. We're talking 60, 70, 80, 100 plus at times. It's crazy um, what you're all signing up for. <laughs> you're all signing up for a long life. And so, but having said that, there's so many cool things out there for you. It doesn't matter if it's cardboard, if it's this, this uh, freaking drink cup, car keys, there's millions of dollars in everything. We're talking about Quipper. I mean, maybe that's not like a super passionate subject, but business is, right? It's going to make grundles of money. And so having said that, I want to preface this. This doctrine, according to Jason, money's not everything. Don't let it ruin your life. I've seen it ruin tons of lives. In the hunting world, there's, a, there's hunting which is, you know it, some of you may know it, is going out and, and having a good time on a weekend. The hunting as I know it, guys are spending 100000 200000 500000 on one tag. These are Jimmy John sandwiches. The owner of Jimmy John is, I used to do his applications and apply him for hunts. Uh, Russ Young was number two in Quaker Oats. He, 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 the Quaker Oats was bought out by Pepsi. He had stock in Quaker Oats. He went, it, it got uh, rolled into Pepsi stock, multimillionaire. Uh, he, was, he calls me his son. So, you know, I've learned, I've been involved with lots of very prominent individuals who made money in lots of other facets of their life, and they enjoy hunting, and they spend tons of money doing it. And so I've seen what happens to some of these people. I've seen them become alcoholic ruin their lives, they have nothing in life, they have no family, their family doesn't care for them because they idolized money. Only thing they cared about was money. Money is very important, we have to have it. And it allows us to do lots of cool things in life. And, and you kind of become a slave to it. I'm a slave to my business to a degree and I have a good wife that keeps me in check on what's really important in life. So that's just an overall, I just wanted to kind of cover that uh, before we get started. My business, we publish a magazine. It's 150 pages a month, monthly, December through June, bi-monthly in the fall when there's not a lot going on. Early in the year, we apply for tags. We're obtaining tags. So it's not just about going hunting. This is about, it's a whole process. There's point systems. There's thousands of dollars wrapped up in a tag. Like you're going to Colorado, you might have to apply for four or five years before you get a tag or whatever. And so there's planning and preparation for lots of people that want to do that, and they hire people to do that. Um, we consult, we also have uh, where, where we apply guys and different things. But with this comes, I need graphic designers. I need the IT guys. This video was built by a guy, way smarter than me. Um, there's lots of people you need. You need customer service people. We have kind of a human resources department in our little, uh, in our little business. And so we're dealing with all of these things. And guess what? I had to learn how to do this. How to, I had to learn how to become an employer. I had to learn how to deal with people. I had to learn what, what mattered to people, what mattered to employees. Sometimes it's not money. Sometimes it's the pat on the back. We all have a love language. You know, yours might be money. The only thing I care about is a, a raise. The only thing I care about is that you care about me. The only thing I care about is time off, my time off and paid vacations, right? Um, everybody has a love language. Everybody has things that matter to them. And as an employer, you have to figure those things out. I didn't know that in 1997. All I knew was time, value, money, you know? And so then all of a sudden, you've just got to learn how to be a businessman. There's so many facets. 
entrepreneurship, I looked, I looked it up because I'm not smart enough to just know what it is. <laughs> and, and it talks about a person who organizes and operates a business or businesses and takes on greater than normal financial risks. That's 100% true, okay? Um, it says, a person who starts a business is willing to risk loss in order to make money or one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of business or enterprise. Common keywords: business and risk. It's 100% true, you're signing up for a lot of sadness. You're signing up for a lot of excitement. You're signing up to own the world. And you're gonna might probably lose your rear end three or four times. But what are you gonna do? You're gonna get up and try it again. Because that's all you know, it's in, it's in you. That's why you're here today. That's all you know. And so, and, and, we, and I've been through that. My family's lost tons. Did a business called Experience America. Going to go state to state and, and develop DVDs. And if you're going through the state, and this is back in DVD days and cassette tapes, and we made those. And then you would drive through and they would tell you about Zion. It would tell you about Bryce. It would tell you about all these things. And we lost everything. Lost everything. Everything. <laughs> There's nothing we didn't lose. And so it's kind of, kind of, those are some major heartaches and breaks and, and where you, you feel ashamed to be in public. You're like, I lost my freaking butt. I'm a loser, you know? So you've got to sign up for these things. But then, but then guess what? Then life moves on. You come up with another idea and you crank forward. What I can tell you is people that are successful, being an entrepreneur, they run their business like they have nothing else. They run their business like this is the, my, this is the only way I'm going to make money. Like it has to succeed or else. If you do that, you have a, a very high chance of success. Give it everything you got and be humble. Be humble. If you think you have a good idea and some 14 people are telling you you don't have a good idea, look twice at your idea. Don't just go forward because you're, you're passionate because it was your idea and now it's personal to you. Make sure it's a good idea. Uh, we've had ideas in the past, and we just got to go, is that a good idea or not? And I love this idea because it's mine, and I'm passionate, and I'm going to sink a bunch of money into it, and I'm probably going to lose my butt because it's not a good idea. And so there's just a couple of things as we get cranking. Um, where are we at here? It's been scrolling, huh? <laughs> Started Ridge Reaper, just went to, had a family business, couldn't get the business bought. Families are tough to work for. Some of you may know that. Went out on my own. Went to Under Armour. I got to stay relevant in the hunting industry. It's all I know. 2012, I go to Under Armour, knock on the door. These guys I'd take hunting. Kip Folks, number two guy, co-founder, if you Google him, of Under Armour with, Kip, with Kevin Plank. Took him hunting and dealt with him. I've dealt with him in business. They know my reputation. You cannot have a clean enough reputation. I want to tell you guys this. Business is business. People say that. Yeah, it is. It is, business is business. You take care of your name and the business will take care of itself. A lot of entrepreneurs make it on their name because names come with relationships. Relationships build more businesses and more backing and more support. And, and it's crazy the doors that have been opened to me because I dealt with these people, but it's taken a lot of years. This isn't gonna come year one out of college. It's gonna come 15 years out of college. And maybe you're lucky and Redmond Salt has the only special grain of salt in the earth and no matter what they do, they're going to make a ton of money. And maybe that's you. Maybe you develop the iPhone. Maybe. And people buy it no matter what you do and there's nothing you can do to wreck the business. It might happen. It's not in my case. People want to knock me off all the time. So I went to Under Armour, Ridge Reaper TV. They knew who I was. Knock on the door, so to speak, and said, I want to do a hunting TV show. Because shows make money, right? TV makes money. Well, it doesn't really make money. Because <laughs> everybody's willing to do it for free. There's, when you've got passions of skateboarding, hunting, professional sports, people are doing willing to do it for free. So you have to be good enough that somebody's willing to pay you to do it. And, and so I'm thinking that's what I need to do. I'll do a TV show with Under Armour. If I do a TV show and they're my title sponsor, other companies will come on board because people follow Under Armour. Got in the meeting, 
head up with a sizzle reel, kind of like this, a sizzle reel, said this is who I'm about, y'all know it, because I've taken you hunting, this is what we're capable of, and I want your support. And they said, well, we want to do, how about we do a hunting TV show and make you the host of it and we'll pay you. Uh, yeah, since I don't know anything about TV, I don't really know why I'm here, and okay, sounds like a good deal. Let's do it. Can't go wrong, right? Can't go wrong. I'm willing to do anything as long as I can basically pay the bills to keep my name relevant and to tell, tell the world who I am. And I'm going to learn this industry. This is a new industry. TV is a new industry for me. So we cranked forward. It was awesome. It was a great experience. Um, came with relationships and, and my name. Um, I don't know how much you guys want to know about that kind of crap. Because <laughs> you're here to pave your own way. Um, but I can tell you, in any facet, and anybody that wants to talk, I'm fine with this being interactive. But in any facet of business, I can, I can give you examples of, of what's happened. I've seen about everything. I've seen crazy, crazy stuff. Um, I think you need to learn how to be uncomfortable. You need learn to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's who you guys are. If you were comfortable, you'd be going out and um, working for Quaystar Gas or Dominion, or you'd be, you'd be kind of thinking about a real career, a normal career. That's more comfortable. I know I'm going to excel in school. I'm going to be up for a job. I'm going to apply in 1,400 different places. I may land in Pennsylvania, but that'll probably be a job for me. Entrepreneurship is uncomfortable. How do I start? How do I start this business? <laughs> and that is the problem. How do you start? How do you crank? We started, A, with a name and a reputation. We also had no debt. Because we had a name and a reputation, before we did our first publication at Epic Outdoors, we had 10 people, QU, um, whole list of outdoor hunting, and I don't even need to say them all, um, on board, because they knew me through Ridge Reaper, they knew me through prior business, on board to support the new publication. We started with no debt and no, had no money. And we still have no debt and we have a little money. And we're able to open up new divisions of our company. And that comes with time, relationships, and um, you know, just who you are as a, as a businessman. Now, if you're coming out of college, fresh out of college, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. In fact, I owed a couple of student debt. I had a good wife that had a little savings account, thankfully, and she had a good job, and the way we started our life, you know. But don't quit your day job, y'all. Don't quit your day job. I know people that quit their job because they have this amazing idea. This amazing idea, I'm going to make a ton of money, and I'm going to sit and wait and wait for this idea to blossom and be a millionaire. It doesn't work that way. Feed your families. You got to feed your families. And true entrepreneurs are working a regular job and 40 hours on the side. It goes back to kind of being careful on what, that you're idolizing work, money, and things like that. You've got to have some balance in your lives, but it's hard when you're trying to make a living and you're trying to eat while you're trying to be an entrepreneur. Some of us are lucky. You get to um, start out with uh, a little cash or whatever. All that's great. Utilize it the best you can. Um, so work ethic. You guys are some of the hardest working people in, on campus. You know you are. You know, that's why you're kind of going out into business. And, and it's not going to quit. It's some, entrepreneurs, businessmen, they can, multi-millionaires, these guys that I know, they don't quit working because it's ingrained in them. They, it's the next kill, so to speak. It's the next business. It's the next idea. It's watching things grow. It's raising a baby. Business is like a baby, and, you're, and it grows, and you're changing this diaper, and it grows into a human, and, it's, and now I've got pride that I've got this 20-year-old that's awesome. Same thing in business. You're watching it grow. You're nourishing it. You're, and that's addicting, too, besides the money. The money comes when it's successful, but it's all, it's all exciting. I built this. I built this business. Quipper, I built it. I get to watch it grow. I, I get to blow the flames, and hopefully it, it's, it's awesome, and, and we did it. You know, how cool is that? There's so many parts of it that are, that are awesome, as well as parts that are scary. Um, marketing. I'm terrible at marketing. Any, any of you here, you should go to as many marketing classes as you can. You can have the best product in the world. 
It may make it, no matter what you do. It may. But there's a ton of products that don't leave the basement, meaning SHOT Show for the outdoor industry is the show where all the businesses get together. There's a basement. That's where kind of the new products are. And it's a little cheaper to be down there, and they have more room. The upstairs is for well-established companies, the Under Armors of the world, the Remingtons, Brownings, well-established businesses. A lot of guys never make it out of the basement, and a lot of guys leave the basement. And they have pretty cool products, unbelievable. But they didn't market. You could have the best product in the world, but you gotta tell people. How are you gonna tell people you have a product to, that's awesome? It's, it's really tough to tell people about your product. It's really tough to get your name out there. You gotta market, and with marketing, it's the toughest thing in the world. It used to be, I can just buy some advertising. I could do TV, now TV's changed. Everybody's on YouTube, y'all are watching YouTube. So Under Armour's marketing to 15 to 24 year olds and y'all are on YouTube. So now we change and now you don't see Ridge Reaper on YouTube or on Outdoor Channel, you see it on YouTube. And so YouTube changes, that's free, it's cheaper, the, po the production's cheaper. Same thing with social media. So I'm doing social media and that's free, but you know, how do you get followers? And there's difference between paid followers and organic, as you all know. There's a lot of people that might have 100,000 followers, but they paid to get there or there's organic followers. Businesses know this stuff. They see it, they know it. What I tell them, they might buy stuff, and the next guy tells them, well, he had paid some, you know, he only has 200 likes and he has 100,000 followers. How does that work out? Well, they were paid followers, they're ghosts. Um, so marketing is, my point of all that rambling, marketing is changing so much. Take as many marketing classes as you can. You have the best product in the world. Without marketing, you're nothing. Your business is nothing. You, pro if, if you could open up a new place in town, Take the new steakhouse out there on, on out by the by the rifle range, the dump, whatever. All right, somebody's got to learn about that. You're not going to drive out there and see it. It's kind of hidden. They got to market. They got to tell people they're open, and then word of mouth. They have great food or something for a minute, or continue to have, and word of mouth, and then pretty soon we we're going there, and their reputation is now feeding it as well as marketing. So marketing is critical. Am I talking about the things you guys want to hear about? Is there anything you want to hear about that maybe isn't in my script? Why do you see D business fail? What's that? Why do your DVD or CD business fail? Okay, we offered a 100% refund. We got it out to all the little gas stations. It has a little, uh, they have little displays, displays right? Mm -hmm. Little roller displays. And and my dad said, 100%, how do, you get a, how do you get a display on a countertop of every Chevron in southern Utah or Utah, period, or Utah, Nevada, Colorado, because we're doing everything, right? It's called Experience America. Well, we're going to offer them a 100% money-back guarantee. They say, fine, bring it in. They bring it in. Don't even open the box. Don't even put it on their counters because the counters are full. We get them all back. I mean, I don't know how to make that a, a success other than... It might have been a good idea if we could, if it was uh, downloadable, but who, your tape, you have to rewind and stop. And I, it might be some of those kind of things. Yeah, and then the marketing thing. Um, kind of experience. Anything else? Any, it was good. It was, it was great. Yeah. You talked about like how, um, like kind of how you started, but I think at least for me, like I just don't know how to even, because you talked about how you started, but you already had like a, a reputation at that point. Okay, How do you I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Ground zero, you've got nothing. How yeah, you got nothing, but it depends on what you want. So are you gonna make a living in your passion? Are you gonna make a living doing just a product, right? Just a product, because we love business. A Couple different things, right? And so if you're gonna do, do your passion, you have, to be, you have to make a name for yourself, and you have to be the best you can be, and you have to be so good that people want to affiliate with you somehow. Passions don't pay money, unless you're the very top. They just don't pay money. And so people can go and play, play pro ball and trying to play pro ball and they go to other countries and they're just, they're doing everything they can but they can never quite make it. And, and they just, I don't wanna call it wasted 10 or 15 years because they learned a lot and they learned to appreciate a lot of different things, but they didn't make it, <laughs> you know? And that's the large majority. And then you've got normal businesses. And so, with me, I started guiding clients. Guiding and hunting, that's kind of the natural way. And, and I didn't have enough money to hunt myself. Jenna and I were making 24000 a year. 
We took a $4,000. I was supposed to be in a new vehicle because people, you need to have a, a quality equipment and not break down. And we were gallivanting all over the West, Western US, and we guided. And 24,000 a year, I took 4,000, put it down on a tr brand new truck, and then I would roll that truck every nine months. And we would try to sell it for more than we paid for it. So we'd beat them up on both ends, and we ended up doing all right, not costing us a ton. Bet, made, a couple, made some money on a few vehicles, but that meant a lot to us, right? 500 bucks was a lot to us. So we did that, I started guiding, made a name for myself by harvesting quality animals on very expensive tags, and I charged more than you should. The, the industry would bear normally because we were, I was putting more into it. I'd give them a month. I'd book two guys a year, and you, with that, you could charge them 20 grand a piece or something. I was doubling my wage. I was making 24,000, ended up at 35,000 over the course of like five years. You remember, this industry doesn't pay anything. It's the cheapest of the professional sports, the hunting. And so I doubled my wage with our side job, and Jen and I put lawn, put lawn in, our, in our house. We also went and we started making money on throw, building houses and rolling houses. And we always, we, I was always taught you go build a house in the nicest neighborhood you can, but the bottom, bottom house that was allowed in Code and Covenant. <laughs> because that house, A, you were hated by your neighbors. B, that house would appreciate fast. It was, in the, it was in an exciting part. We were up on the hill. It was an exciting part. We could barely make the payment. And I've always taught, I was always taught, <laughs> because money's in houses at times, and this isn't what you should do. But to maximize and pay the absolute max you could on your payment, meaning take on more the max debt you could because that house is going to appreciate that much more. But it's stressful. Again, back to entrepreneurship, it's stressful to be in debt. Hate debt. Hate debt. Wolves at the door is nothing worse. And there's nothing worse than somebody owning you. Nothing. We grew in this business. We grew slow. Slower than I wanted to. We had partners ready to write a check. Hey, if you want a partner, I want to write. A, I'll write you a check. I want to pitch in here a minute the question is, you know, how did you get started? How did you make a go for yourself? And he kind of covered it, but in truth, he spent probably half our lives at, at that early period of time in our in our marriage and with the young kids. He probably spent half our lives gone. He hunted. He scouted. He started. Most people start hunting in August. Jason started in June. You know, he started running trail cameras. He started scouting. He worked so much. He would, he would work his full-time job, and then when he got off his full-time job, he would head out to the hills, and he would come home at 10, 11, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. He'd sleep a few hours, and he'd go back to his day job, work it, and head back out to the hills again. And so if you're going to be an entrepreneur and start your own business, you have to just admit right now <laughs> that you're going to work two full-time jobs in one, honestly. You're going to do your regular job. You're going to put another full-time job into your entrepreneurship, whatever you're working on, at least that much. And for a lot of you who aren't married yet, carefully choose your partner. Not every wife can be left home with three or four little kids day after day after day while you build your career. And so... It's a really a family commitment. Yeah. You can't do it alone. You need a family to work on it. I feel and like... It's really a lot of time. I feel like Jana... So our successes, my successes, were, were her successes too at times. And she could feel that momentum coming. And so it was worth it to her. You know, it was worth it to her well, to I move forward. I always feel it. At times I thought, this may go nowhere. <laughs> we may be broke. <laughs> we may be starting over. We might have kids we don't know how we're going to feed. But he had a passion for it and he's... He's driven, and he's not at all lazy. You know, he's, he's very, a very hard worker. So what I really thought was, well, when all this blows over and it doesn't go anywhere, he'll still go out and get a job, and between the two of us working, we'll be able to take care of things. Yeah, and get a wife that's employable. And it worked. <laughs> and I was employable. I she was employable. <laughs> she, she, she was teacher, she taught, and then she also um, was in the medical field and had a BSA or BSN. Nursing degree, whatever. And, and it's not whatever. It's not whatever. Very important. But it also gave us stability. And the finance background gave me support stability. Although it was maybe a false sense of stability. So what if I have an education? What does that mean? Pretty uneducated if I didn't go out in my field. And so, but, but in my mind, I'm educated. I can get a job. That's kind of my mind. I could always resort to insurance or something like that. 
And so it kind of maybe was one of those things. One thing I want to say, it's just in my mind. The world can take everything from you. They can take your money, your cars. They can take your houses. The world can take everything. But it can't take your name or your reputation. And just, it, I, can't, I guess I can't uh, illustrate that enough because in my profession, everybody knows you. Everybody. The hunting world is small. There's a lot of hunters, but the professional side of the hunting world is small. And they know all your intricate details, maybe more than you want them to know. And so it's been uh, ingrained in me that, you know, your name will carry you through. We had partners, lots and lots of partners come, meaning 10. Okay, that's a lot in my, bu my book. If you need a partner and you're starting a business, I wanna, I wanna invest. And that it's not like, hey, I need to see your financials. I need to make sure this has got a, got a good ROI. Um, what are you guys gonna do? I'm gonna check up on you. I'm gonna make sure you're working. Our reputation preceded us. I just wanna, I wanna give you some money to do good things with it. <laughs> Basically, I'm gonna have a title. I'm gonna be the, you know, the lean on your title and, and we trust you. You've done it before. You've got potential and the world knows you, so I, want, I need a place to invest. And we've had a, we've had a lot of that. Ten, ten significant powerhouse people and entities want to do that. And I didn't want to be owned by anybody. Guess what? When they invest in you, they get to decide a few things. And now I'm putting my name on some project I don't want to do. Or maybe I'm asked to compromise my integrity. And there's a lot of those kind of things. Maybe we're going to go sell a business and you need to cook the books. You guys are going to see all this. I've seen it all. You're going to see it all. You're going to deal with lawyers. You're going to deal with court. That's a lot of business. I had a California businessman say, hey, Jason, that's just part of business. This, this will come and go. Very, very hurtful. Ticked me off. Frustrated me. And Because what's right is right, right? Well, not necessarily in business. Keep your eyes open. Businessmen are smart dudes. So we never took on a partner. We never took on a partner. I do have three, two other partners. When you take on a partner, I had two other partners. They were, they were with me from the beginning. My brother-in-law, who's no longer my brother-in-law, but we're tied as brother-in-laws, okay? Married my sister. I also have one of, my, one of my better friends, one of my best friends, and we're all equal. Will you bring on partners? When you can't buy what they're providing, when you cannot hire somebody, if it's your idea, don't just bring on a partner because you think it's fun. Bring them on if you need money, okay? Sometimes you need it. But carefully, be careful there. Don't let them own more than what you, don't let them own 51%. If you can help it. And bring on something. You can't pay people to work like you are willing to work. It's your idea, you're the entrepreneur. You're willing to work 80 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week. You don't, you don't take Saturdays off. Sundays, I really try not to work on Sundays. Sometimes you just don't have a choice. I really try not to. It's nice to have a break. Um, but sometimes, maybe if you had a partner, they tell you, <laughs> clock in, clock out. You know what? Get lost. I'm not clocking in and clocking out. Neither should you. If it's your business, don't, don't allow that to happen because control can come in and take over what you do. Um, and so with partners, very hard. Partners are very hard. But don't be a bean counter. And what I mean by that is don't be counting every little thing. This partner worked a little less than me. I deserve a little more. Don't justify taking money out of the kitty because of something else. Or we used my vehicle to go to Vegas. Use their vehicle to go to Reno. We try to even that out or rent a vehicle. You do not, you want to be conscientious of that. But having said that, if you, if you keep track of every little thing, your partnership's doing to fail. Just doing the fell. It just you just can't do it, and and so we, we're tight as tight, and we've we're, we've cranked. We've been through some tough times too, though, and that galvanizes people. That galvanizes partnerships. Now, if it was just somebody that owned me, they go about their job over in New York or Chicago or California, where some of my clients are, they get to say, "Hey, uh, I want I just want to see some books, you know? I want to see. Well, I mean, maybe I don't want to show you my books, you know? They're my books." Maybe I've got a method to my madness and stuff. Well, you can keep your freedom. If you can keep your debt down or none, you get to keep your freedom. And so um, grow at a pace that you can handle. Grow at a pace your wife can earn money at, at the hospital. You know, 
as long as you can pay the bills and you've got a good idea, you're going you're gonna to probably hit pay dirt, especially if you have work ethic. If you have work ethic and passion for what you're doing, you can probably make it. You, it's America. You're going to probably make it. So, um, the employee-employer relationship. This is very unique. <laughs> you know, employees do just enough not to get fired. Employers pay just enough not to have you walk off the job. And so there's that, that relationship is frustrating but critical to understand. If you have good employees, pay them. Pay them some money. Learn their love language. If it's a pat on the back, you're just so great. You're doing so great. Because you do think that, but sometimes it's not my love language, so it's harder for me to say. It's not on the top of my head. I've had to learn. Yeah, I do think that. I do think you're great. I just don't say it because it's not my love language, so I, I forget to say it. But it means everything to them. And the, and the number one thing I hear from employees, I just wasn't appreciated. I just didn't feel appreciated. When you appreciated them, I thought a raise told you I appreciated you. I thought money showed you I appreciated you. You're still here, aren't you? I think, you're, I think the world of you. I gave you more paid vacation. I, you asked for time off. I've never told you no. I thought that meant I appreciate it. Well, no, I like the pat on the back. Like, you never tell me I did a good job. Oh, I could have withgone, I could have kept the money. <laughs> told them they did a good job and you'd be shocked. People will do things for a name on their parking spot over money. I mean, you'd be shocked at what motivates employees. Find out what motivates them. You want to keep them? Find out what motivates them and build them up. Build them up financially, build them up emotionally, Make them feel like you care. Make them feel like they're a viable piece of the business. The growth is occurring because they're a part of it. They love that. What's that? You and you do care. You do care. But it's because it's not my love language, it's harder for me. I only have one or two love languages, right? And so it's harder for me to understand that. <laughs> Communicate. You, can't, oh, you cannot communicate enough. Okay. This day and age, do y'all answer texts like this or answer phone calls like this? It's just not the way of this day and age. Just not. But type A aggressive personalities. Y'all, some of you are type A red, aggressive, jerk personalities. That's what businessmen are. They're very aggressive. Entrepreneurs, the best entrepreneurs are type A red, aggressive, tactless, <laughs> jerks at times. And so we want an answer to our texts. And if you're not answering, that relationship's getting frustrated. You don't even know it. You, you know, it's normal not to answer. But for a lot of guys, it's not normal. So over-communicate. Just over-communicate. You bet, sir. Yep, I'm on it. I'm doing it. Pretty soon you're like, that person cares about my business. And because that person cares about my business, and because they've got integrity, and because they're honest, I'm going to put them as a department head. And if that's not enough, I want them, if they could run this place and I could go hunt more, I'd do that too. We'll figure that out. So value people, but a lot of employers, this is common. I mean, I've got friends in HVAC, heating and air. I've got plumbers, own plumbing companies. It, everybody says, you know, business would be great if it wasn't for the employees. Business would be great if it wasn't for the employees. But you have to have employees to have business. And so, and, it's, and that's true. Employees will bring a lot of heartache, stress, mental anxiety, problems in the workforce at times. Uh, but so you gotta learn how to manage that. You gotta learn how to hire right. You gotta learn how to fire right. You gotta learn how to build them up and work with them. And they're your best asset. If you can have a great team, they're your best asset. Don't let them go. Don't let them go. Marketing and people, how much to pay them? If they're making you money, pay them. Pay them a lot. <laughs> Doesn't matter, because they're making you money. And marketing, if it pays for itself, you can't do it, enough of it. If it costs you $10 million to market, I get it. First year out of college, you probably don't have $10 million. Neither do I. But you gotta figure out how to do it, because it's gonna pay for yourself. You're gonna make 11. That's a million. If we're only putting $20 down, we're gonna make 20 cents. Okay, I'd made some money. You got to do it. Whatever it does to make money. We send out free magazines. We're doing, we did podcasts. Podcasts are the best thing we've ever done. I'm one-on-one -on -one in their ear when they're in the car or on the Stairmaster or whatever they're doing. One-on-one. -on -one. They get to hear me. 
everything's blocked out. I'm in their ear. I'm in their little car over the sound system. I'm in their ear, whatever they're doing. And they're listening to me. They're developing a relationship with me and Adam and my other partners. And it's kind of sick because I don't know this relationship that's going on. And they'll call in and be like, hey, you know, and about your wife and your kids. And what's your name again? Because I forget, they forget, they don't realize, well, we have this relationship. Oh, yeah, it is one-sided. It just, it's a natural thing. These podcasts, you guys probably listen to them, and, and you get addicted to them. Um, and so what a great marketing tool. I get to be one-on-one, tell them about new things. We're going to open up a di- new division of our company, um, mostly because we can't get guys to advertise in that division, and there's money to be made. And so I'm like, well, if we can't get a guy to advertise and stick around, let's just do that. And we'll advertise ourselves. We'll be on the podcast. We'll be in the magazine. We'll be on YouTube. We'll sell this product. And I don't want to tell you what it is yet. But there's a division, and I'm already paying the light bill. My my base company is paying the roof, the lights, the phone, the employees. I may have to add half an employee or whatever, but I only do that based upon need. I might have, a couple of the employees might have a side job of working this new division, as well as me and the owners. And then once, I, once that warrants enough work, money, whatever, sales, I'll get a new employee. It's paying for itself. And if it doesn't pay for itself, okay, the parent company's paying the light bill. So it's just you start out small, you start out small, and then you build as you keep going. And if the, employee, if the, if the customer wants it, then you've got to build it. Well, you, you don't have to. You own yourself. You own yourself. And maybe you got too much bit off as it is. I mean, I can make so much money in all different facets, but I can only do so much. And I only want to do so much. I don't want to own the whole world. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard to let those opportunities go by. Well, I'm doing Quipper, and it's cranking along, and I'm making them out, but I've also got an idea over here, and then I've got an idea over here, and I just, uh, and then pretty soon I forget about Quipper, who's paying all the bills for all these other fun ideas. Uh, Goes back to... uh, our passions and employees, and I'm a little random, but it's funny, the employees, a lot of employees will spend 20%, give you 20% of their mental capacity and ability, and you're 80% of their wage. And they'll put 80% of their passion into whatever they're passionate about. I mean, they're cranking, after hours, they're cranking, and this thing, whatever they're cranking on, is making no money or very tough. And so you'll find that. And it's hard because an employer, you're like, I make, I mean, this business is, you, you, this business is allowing your family to eat and you guys to have a good life and you're only giving me 20%. And so that's another, find what they're passionate about. Maybe you put them in a passionate spot, if you can. Or maybe you're that employee that's putting 80% into your passion. Figure out how to make money in this 80%. If you have passion, you'll have drive. If you have drive, you're, gonna, you're willing to work 80 hours a week. If you don't have anything, I have a friend, makes great money, sells fertilizer uh, to farmers and stuff. And so, but he told, he's told me, he says, I have nothing I'm passionate about. <laughs> it's nothing he's passionate about. Nothing you're passionate about. No shiz, nothing. And so, well, if that's true, then he, but he is passionate about business. He could make, if it was not passionate about uh, products that go on crops, maybe he's just passionate about business, and this happens to be what he fell into. Y'all are going to fall into some things. It goes back to those relationships. You're working. You start working at some company. um, You learn how to do electrical. You learn how to do whatever. Pretty soon it's not about the electrical. It's about owning the company that does the electrical and hiring the people that do the electrical and and growing at a pace you you can afford to grow at and what you're good at, and finding your niche. If you're gonna compete, you gotta find your niche. You gotta find out, or just compete. I guess you could just compete. If, there's a, if you're in a, an industry that needs more, comp, more competition, then great. Um, I have gone all over the place. What would you, what do you want me to, what do you, what do you want to bring up? Do you have any other sources of income besides your primary business? Not, not now. So I guided, and I, so I guided hunters, and um, yeah, for 20 years, and basically I'm retired guide, and, and I'm done, and I, and I, 
at some point they can't charge enough anymore because I'm honoring now. <laughs> That's a customer service business. It's a cu guiding isn't just isn't about killing, and and a lot of you may not like hunting. That's why I'm not talking about hunting. These these things these these aspects are in all business. But I lost my my zeal for customer service. They say what customer service lasts how how many years? Seven. Customer service you wore out at seven because they wear you out. They grind on you. People grind on you, and you don't want you don't get good service. <laughs> and so I got to wear. I don't want them in my truck anymore. You know, they don't care about my truck. They think they bought this hunt and now they can treat my truck how they want. They treat my stuff how they want and I'm a servant. And it was great and I had no choice, but it wasn't a natural for me. It wasn't naturally for me, but I had to make a name somehow and I couldn't afford to hunt. So I had to guide, produce big animals, so to speak. And now I was top of my industry, but they helped me get there and it was a means to the end. It was a means to keep staying in the industry. I further my name in the industry, just like if we were doing electrical work. I don't want to stay doing light sockets or, or outlets forever, but it's a means to the end. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to learn how to do it right. I'm going to learn that. I'm going to learn this aspect. I'm going to learn this aspect. I'm going to learn about people. I'm going to learn about business, and I'm going to own the business. And so that's, it was kind of a means to the end, but I don't do it anymore. I could do it. Sometimes... Uh, there's nice people out there and I conv I'm convinced to spend time, but give, keep in mind, these are time, this is time I'll never get back. And I didn't value time when I was your age, so I could give it away. Now I'd rather give my time away to somebody that cared rather than sell my time to somebody that didn't. But, but that comes with time. You don't have a choice at the moment. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna be cranking on business. You're young and I'm super excited for you. I want, I want you to know you, the world, the world is open to you. How cool is that? You can do whatever it is you want. A couple things to keep in mind. Just don't let it be your idol. Don't worship money, but be the best you can be at what you do and the money will come. I had a really good acquaintance, let's call him, client, client acquaintance, and he bought... You know the gas station at Green River? Like the Arby's gas combo in Green River, Utah on the way to Grand Junction? Well, he had both sides. He had the Chevron and he had the other side too. And, and then he bought lots of like subways and gas stations and pretty soon he's kind of worth a lot of money. And he was buying properties up in Wyoming and all of these things. And he said, he's, he's awesome for one-liners. He says, worry about the pennies and the dollars to take care of themselves. And he had all these one-liners, and he's so right, because guess what? Gas goes up a penny. Well, if you bought it, and whatever's in the ground, you bought it a certain amount, but you take on a new delivery, and you paid a little more, you can up the price, and whatever's in the ground. All of these things played a part of his business. And so he worried about pennies, because he was selling millions and millions of gallons and stuff like that. And so everybody in business has to learn their industry and what makes these one-liners make sense to certain people, and some people, they don't have to worry about it too much. Um, anything else? Anything else? You're, are, are you all interested in entrepreneurship or just kind of doing this class to do it? Who's interested in entrepreneurship? Wow. You're going to have to move out of Cedar City because y'all can't <laughs> compete with each other. I you can't market enough. Market. You can't treat people well enough. You can't take care of your reputation enough. And if you're honest, people, people feel that. I walk into Under Armour, the top people, I didn't have to have no checks and balances. They, my reputation preceded me. I got to go do that opportunity. Your opportunities will come. People want to affiliate with honest people because you, <laughs> you cannot beat a cheater and a liar. You can't. They lay awake at night. And you know what? I used to be innocent to the fact that oh, everybody's got a good heart. They don't. They don't have a good heart. <laughs> they don't. But when you find them, you want to affiliate yourself with them. And everybody else is the same way, including cheaters and liars. They want to affiliate themselves with you because you're not going to steal from them. Be careful who you partner with. Take on partners when you need them only. Own yourselves. Buy your way out of debt. 
Get rid of the debt. Even if you make less, you own yourself, have freedom, build it. It's going to come. Whatever it is, quipper, uh, landscaping, making windows, in fixing windows, whatever it is, these, handle, these handles, all this shiny metal comes from somewhere. There's just amazing amounts of money. All of these desks, somebody put in all this crap. And so what is it? And if, you don't, if you're not finding something, if you, if you want to make a lot of money and enjoy your passion, don't make your livelihood your passion. Go make a lot of money. Develop a great business and go do your passion and enjoy life. Um, Can we just wind up with some, some of the things in your career that have been most enjoyable? Like you've seen some amazing places and people to end things. Can you just share some of that? Um, some, some I've seen some crazy things. I've hunted Mexico and seen some crazy things. I, I, I learned some of these things. I, I lay awake at night sometimes and I look at, like, if I were to die tomorrow, and let's face it, any time after 45, every, every year is a bonus, right? And after 60, <laughs> it's really a bonus. And I look at it and I say, you know, did I, did I really appreciate time? Or was I too busy worried about business and I was trying to get that hunt done as fast as I could? And I would go to Mexico and I broke bread with people living in two-sided huts. Um, saw things like, People making a living off of prostitution, stealing gas, right next to my lease and where we're hunting. And we would go in and have dinner there. And, and, the, and, and so um, I learned to value America. I learned to value the ability to be an entrepreneur and make good money and own myself and not have to be owned by people. And, and I just saw some of these crazy things that made me value life. And my first 10 or 15 years, I was type A, aggressive, red, and I probably still am, okay? But, I have, but, I, but I've learned to have some more feeling for people, just people and life and appreciation for life by seeing some of these crazy things. Canadians, same thing, up in the middle of nowhere, somebody living off of trapping in cabins by themselves. I mean, there's just been some awesome, amazing stuff that, that I've experienced, I've... I've flown over some amazing stuff and hunted some. It's not about the kill in my industry necessarily. Although, I, I will tell you one thing. I, it's the saddest thing in the world, but my industry, I'm judged off of what I harvest. And it's a yearly judgment. If I go a year without it, they're like, oh, he's lost his edge. He's, he, hey, he, did, he does all this research and publishes magazines about it. And he talks about it on podcasts, but he's he not killing anything. And... So he must suck, <laughs> you know, and I'm entitled to down years too. And so there's a lot of pressure, but people are judging me off of my hunting. My business, they talk to me and they think I run a great business and have a great family life based off my hunting. They're not judging me off my life and my family and my business skills. And so there's a lot of that that comes with passion that I think is unfortunate. There's a lot more to me than just being a hunter. However, my people in my industry don't know that necessarily. Um, although the product, the end product is is something I'm proud of. I think the most amazing thing, I, it's been hard being comfortable being uncomfortable. And I'm uncomfortable all the time. My industry is the first thing to go. When Trump does something dumb or whatever, stuff happens, uh, and the, let's say the economy fails, whatever, we go to major war, my, my, the people who spend money on hunting will be me, my industry. So we're constantly trying to live out of debt have a savings, and, and get prepared. Brace yourself for things that, that are unforeseen. So. Awesome. Any other questions before we? All right. I want to present this to you to say thank, thank you. you. It's appreciate that. Cedar Woods. So thank you. It'll be a reminder of your trip here to SUU. So thank you. You bet. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm.